So I start with a quote also. Um, my topic will be quite different, and the basis for much of the work that, that I do with my colleagues and my students, who I acknowledged on the first slide, um, was first done, or at least first anticipated, by David Cutts, a professor at, uh, for, for many years in, here in Stockholm. Uh, Cutts was a, uh, a refugee from Nazi Germany. Um, who found safe haven here in Sweden. And uh, I would like to acknowledge his role in the uh, development of an interest in the psychology of touch, and not just a, an interest, but an experimental interest. And my focus will be on an experimental psychology or a cognitive psychological approach to Braille reading. It's not that I'm uninterested in the educational or pedagogical aspects of it. I am, but that's not my expertise. And I leave it for others to think about ways in which um, uh, data collected by, by experimental and cognitive psychologists might be applied uh, in the classroom, in Braille, in, uh, in teaching uh, children to, to use tactile materials, maps, and, and the like. Okay. You'll be aware how sophisticated a system the hand is. The hand is not just a sophisticated perceptual system through which we touch the world, know the world, um, interact with the world, it's a highly sophisticated motor system. The dexterity of the hand is quite remarkable. And I take braille reading to be one instance of the very sophisticated, uh, haptic uh, use of the hands. By haptic, I refer to a technical term that, that um, refers to active touch, not just being touched, but touching of objects, if that distinction makes sense to people. Braille, however, superimposes on that uh, sophistication an additional complexity or sophistication. Namely, what is being touched is loaded with linguistic meaning. It's not sandpaper. It's not silk. It's Braille. And it means something. I'm very bad at this, excuse me. Now I've lost it. <clears throat> Sorry. So, no picture? Sorry. I take reading to be not one skill in the print mode or braille mode, not one skill, but a constellation of skills. And, that, and these skills are best examined not by self-reflection, not by introspection, but by experimentation and scientific methods. The reason for this is that these skills... Can I go on to the next one? Next one, please. These skills happen very fast. When people read, they might be indulging in any one or uh, any set, subset of all of these things from perception, pattern identification, recognition. That implies memory, that you remember what it is you're, look, you're feeling now. Memory storage and retrieval, attentional focus. <clears throat> we know in print reading, People don't attend just to the word they're looking at, but they attend to where they're going. In Braille, people anticipate the words that are coming next. That's their attentional focus going down the line. Decision making, prediction, grammar processing, meaning extraction, and the planning and the control of movements. Now, when people read 120 words per minute, that means two per second are going past. In order to extract meaning, your brain has to be working very fast. 
the, the fastest operations we have are subconscious ones. They're not ones that you can, you can look into your own mind and know what you did. If I ask my students how they read print, they think their eyes move smoothly. The eyes do nothing of the sort. And print and braille at this level are quite different. It doesn't want to, it does, okay. So, print reading is said to be intermittent, discontinuous, and selective. People know, claim this because they measure the eye movements and the fixations and what people actually do when they read. They do not move smoothly. They move by focusing on individual words, fixating them for brief periods of time. Those are seconds there. I just made them up, but they approximate what, <laughs> they approximate what a printed print reader will do. Okay, so not everything gets a fixation. The movements between these fixations are very rapid. And during these, these eye movements, the brain takes in nothing. It only takes in information during the fixation, more or less. That's true. But during a fixation, the brain also has to predict, where do I make the next eye movement? All within 200 or 300 milliseconds, it does this. Now, anybody who can read Braille as fast as a print reader, and I've come across a couple, 250 plus words per minute, they move along a line of text like so, supposedly in a constant, continuous, and exhaustive way. Unlike print readers, Braille readers are, set, are thought to move at a more constant speed as they go along here. The, the contact is continuous because it is the contact, as David Katz reminded us, which gives us access to that world. And it is exhaustive. Braille readers tend to read almost all the line. They don't leave it to chance by not actually reading it. Print readers often skip words. Okay, now the visual field for print readers is layered. That is, there's a very small foveal region where high acuity and color perception uh, it, it takes place. There's a slightly larger parafoveal region where where print readers can see out of the corner of you, the, the eye, if I can put it like that in English, where to go next, how long the next word is. Is it short, is it long? What's it likely to be? And peripheral fields out extending to the line. In Braille, only what is, lies beneath the finger pads is what is read. There is no preview of the sort that sighted readers uh, have. I don't know why this doesn't quite work for me. <clears throat> okay, sorry. Okay. Okay, so. Braille reading involves nothing in the way of fixations. At least one finger is always moving. Do we know why that is? Why do, why do Braille readers not indulge in fixations? I've measured many Braille readers, and I hardly ever see them stop and think. They're moving all the time. Why is that? We think it has something to do with the kinds of receptors that underlie touch. Braille reading seems to be like other aspects of tactile map reading, uh, uh, texture perception more generally. That is, people deploy very particular ways of moving, make contact and move laterally. Don't scrub, go laterally. That's how we, we explore surfaces if we want to judge their smoothness, sandpaper if we want to judge their roughness and the like. How do people know how to move in order to get the information? These are the kind of questions we ask, because we don't know. Ignorance is our sort of uh, grist for the mill. We don't know, we try to figure it out. 
Now, in Braille reading, Braille, because the contact is continuous, Braille reading uh, generates a, a stream of activity at the finger pad. Consider just one for, the, for argument's sake. One, a stream of activity that has to be understood at, so, at some level. Do people know how much force to use? Do people naturally know how much, how much speed to apply? How many finger pads to use? Is Braille a bit like the visual problem of seeing a moving visual scene and deciding what, what objects are in there, even though they're never standing still? Or might Braille be something more akin to listening? A constant stream of activity which must be, which must be uh, processed in real time. How do we understand Braille? Well, in the 1980s, uh, Paul Bertelsen um, in Belgium and his group came up with some very beautiful diagrams showing Braille at work. I don't know if you've seen these, so uh, I'll try and explain them uh, for those who, who can't see or are not used to, can't read the print. <clears throat> this is the lateral position of uh, reading fingers from left to right for five, one, two, three, four, five readers. This is time up this way. So these traces that you observe here are a single reading finger moving from left to right, coming back to the next line, moving along that line, moving back, along that line, back, and so on. You can see from these things, in some, some cases you've got a single finger reading. In other cases you've got two fingers reading. This is sometimes called scissoring. You can see what the two fingers are doing there. But you can see, observe some other things too that uh, were, were notable for Berlitzen. The smooth movements, that is the relatively smooth way the finger moves from left to right. The occasional reversals of direction. When Braille, the Braille reading finger goes from right to left in English. The scissoring of the two hands. In fact, most interesting to me is this seemed, these examples seem to suggest that at one level the brain may be reading two lines, separate text, simultaneously. Try doing that with your eyeballs. <laughs> However, one of the limitations, beautiful as these things are, I love them, I love these, uh, these figures, but, but video recordings are passe. They're, they tend to be prone to error. They're very time consuming to process. And so we, try, we thought, hmm, is there a better way? Is there a way to really precisely measure the eye movements? One of the motivations for this is in the print literature, all of the major de uh, developments of uh, explanations of how we read print derive from the very precise measuring of the eye movements and the fixation durations that fluent readers uh, indulge in when they read, when they read text of different difficulty, for example or text containing ambiguity. We tried, we're trying. I don't know that we're, we can say we've succeeded exactly, but we're trying to do the same thing for Braille reading by measuring precisely what the finger does when people read. And this is part of my story today. Okay, so what we do, other people have different techniques, but what we began with was taking a digitizing tablet, the kind you may see in a tech store, where you can draw on it with an electronic pen, save it to a disk uh, or your computer, and, and manipulate it later on. We take the inner workings of the digital pen, which, when applied to a digi digitizing tablet, records very precisely the location of the pen tip. And we, monitor, we put that on the finger of a Braille reader. Just one pen tip, just one finger. And we ask Braille readers to read single lines of text that vary in different ways. I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a bit. But we measure the position of the finger, the, the center of the finger, 
100, we can go up to 200 times per second. Ooh, that's pretty fast. 200 times per second, it samples the position of that pen tip. You put all of those together and you start to manipulate the data. You filter it and you differentiate it and you can come up with a measure of the velocity of the finger as it crosses a line of text. If you differentiate again, you get acceleration patterns. For people who are uh, interested in the motor control of braille reading, this is very important to know these details. <clears throat> when you do this, you find that what looks like a smooth trace from Bertelsen's data, in reality, is not smooth at all. This is the velocity of the finger as it moves uh, along a line from, from time zero to the end of the line, maybe three and a half seconds later. This is the velocity of the finger as it reads. That's quite erratic, intermittent, we call it. Why does it bump like this? What's all that about? Well, we, when we first measured these things, we were quite surprised. We thought the, 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 the movements would be much smoother than that. But it turns out you get these irregular traces, and we don't know why that is. It could be, for example, that because Braille is rough kind of texture, at, at least in its, its uh, metallic, metallically embossed form, in paper it's a little softer, but it's texture, and maybe the texture catches the ridges of the finger and makes the, the, the smooth movements impossible. Maybe it's the, the friction at the finger pad and surface that causes these uh, irregularities in the velocity trace. Perhaps it has to do with language processing. Perhaps braille readers are sensitive, as print readers are too, to syntax, to grammar to word meaning, word ambiguity, uh, word frequency, word length. Maybe this contributes. And there's a third possibility, and that is that it is, maybe it is the speed at which the reading finger moves, which in the big scheme of things is really quite slow. Because fingers can move very fast when you want them to. Braille reading tends to involve movements that are much slower than that. And slow movements may not be smooth movements. So we entertained these three possibilities, acknowledging also that it could be a contribution, uh, a combination of all three. It doesn't have to be just one of these possibilities. Okay, so the first series of experiments, we took fluent, as, as fluent a readers as we could find. Uh, most of this was originally conducted in uh, Phoenix, Arizona with colleagues at Arizona State University. We got fluent daily readers of Braille, asked them to read with a single finger, sentences on a single line. We used grade two. We asked them to read as accurately as possible, but as fast as possible. So this is a common thing in experimental psychology. Be as accurate as possible, but given that you get it right, be as fast as possible. For ordinary people, this is like not comfortable, but you've got to push yourself right to the limits. When you do that, you find out what the limits of the perceptual and cognitive and motor systems are. So be as, be as accurate as possible and as fast as possible. This is a sample of a trace you get when you ask people to read a line of text. I just picked one at random. But what I want to show you is uh, what we did was we said, well, look at this trace. What do we get from this? What should we measure? One of the things we noticed is we, should, we could measure the average speed, that is the mean velocity, and rather than measure it in words per minute, we measure it in, term, in, in terms of centimeters per second. We measure the, num the, the, the bumpiness of this trace. We refer to it as its intermittency. Up and down, up and down, up and down. Notice, if you have a look at it, do you find anywhere, anywhere where people are moving at a constant speed? Doesn't happen. 
It's always, the finger's always accelerating or decelerating, accelerating or decelerating, accelerating or decelerating. It's never, there is no cruise control for the braille reading finger. Now, conventionally, velocities that are positive are from left to right. Velocities which are negative, these ones here, indicate reversals where the finger went no longer going from left to right but from right to left. Okay? You can see that this person read along here in that fashion, reached a point here and decided, oh, I got to go backwards. Made a velocity uh, uh, a reversal of direction, reaching six centimeters per second backwards, and then reread that passage there at a slightly higher velocity than originally, and then sort of faded out at the end there. Okay, so this is what an individual reading trace looks like from a fluent reader. We've given them many. Uh, examples of uh, text to read, but here are just some. Okay, if you have a look at the figures here, you'll see that these are. How would you describe those? I think they look like someone grabbed some spaghetti and stretched it out on a table, and you've got like 20 strands of spaghetti there. It's hard to see a pattern. It's hard to see a pattern. But each of these examples comes from sentences where we manipulated the word frequency, high or low. So these ones are words with high word uh, frequency in the English language versus low word, uh, sorry, high word frequency, high word frequency, low word frequency for these two. This one also has internally high letter combination frequencies. There are people who measure these things, believe me. Double N, very common in English. I-O-N, very common, right? So, so these are high uh, letter combinations, high frequency. These are low ones, high frequency letter combinations paired with low frequency words and low frequency, low frequency. The only difference that I see when I look at these things happens when they encounter, they encounter the key words here. Rather than these traces being systematically different in some way, suddenly going down or up, what you find is you get more reversals when people encounter words w that have low, freq low frequency content, either in terms of their word frequency especially, or in terms of their interior contents. Bertelsen noticed this, and we agree. Word uh, recovery from miscomprehension of words is often accomplished not by stopping and thinking, but by reversing and rereading. Reversals and rereading are a very common feature of the Braille reader. This is the Braille reader's repair mechanism. Notice, it didn't have to be that way. You could stop and think, hmm, what word is this? And then start again, right from where you left. But they don't. They go back and reread. There's something about the interior cycle of processing that demands this, it appears to us. Now, we also measured braille readers, we said, okay, we're going to give you some stuff that makes no sense whatsoever. It's just going to be a repetition, let's say, of the letter A, all the way along. Repetition of L, all the way along. Repetition of W, all the way along. We want you to move, kind of as if you were reading, but your goal is to move at as constant a speed as possible. Constant a speed as possible. If you look at these traces, you'll see that that's, that can't be done. There's no flat period here. The smoothest ones are the fastest ones. Anything else has got that squiggly, squiggly, squiggly look. Acceleration, deceleration. Now, out of this tangle of velocity strands or traces, some order appears if you do the following.
If you plot the mean speed, the average speed with which someone read that line against the number of little inflection points in the trace, you find, a, I think, a quite remarkable and beautiful pattern. Namely, the faster you go, the smoother you are. The slower you go, the more of these technically acceleration zero crossings, inflection points, the more of them there are. That's true, no matter whether you're reading sentences of different complexity, you're reading out loud or silently, you're reading text or meaningless rep repeated uh, symbols. I think that kind of lines up very well. That suggests to us that when people read that the number of up and down things don't have much to do, don't have so much to do with language processing, don't have so much to do with texture, but have a lot to do with the way in which the moving is taking place. We didn't know this before we began. So we might be in some sense disappointed because we would like to see, oh, here's where the Braille reader encounters that tricky word. Notice what he does. That doesn't seem to happen. Maybe there's a reversal. But there's nothing like the print reader's extended fixation on a word that is unusual or ambiguous. Braille readers like to go at their own personal average speed, but that average speed is bumpity, 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 bumpity. That's a technical term, bumpity, bumpity. <laughs> <clears throat> We've looked at garden path sentences. These are ones where people, if you read some of those examples, you'll get a feel for what, what we did to them. You go to read the sentence and you anticipate that a certain word will be an adjective and it turns out to be a noun. Something that you think is going to be a noun turns out to be a verb. When you encounter these kinds of words in Braille, fluent readers do pretty much what they did on those earlier ones. They go through them at much the same speed so these are their reading speeds in centimeters per second. You can see that as things become uh, less ambiguous or tricky up here, uh, people speed up. But this trickiness comes about these lower speeds for, for, for these examples at the top, the syntactically ambiguous ones, come about because Braille readers make more reversals when they encounter them. They go along and they don't stop and say, hmm, I, I parsed that sentence in an incorrect way. Let me stop and start over. They go back and physically start over by reading it and reassigning grammatical roles to words. But you get the same pattern, the same relationship between the mean reading speed and the number of acceleration zero crossings in these types of sentences. We, we did another thing too. We said, okay, we want to look at the reversals that people make. So we, we created an experiment that had, had a parallel originally in print reading where we asked people to explicitly make reversals. So they had to read a sentence containing two nouns. They got to the end of the sentence and then there was a symbol that either said first or second. If it said first, they were to make a reversal from the end of the sentence as fast and as accurately as possible to the first noun that they encountered, wherever that was. Or if it said second, they go to the second noun they encountered, which would have been closer. Does that make sense? We created sentences that were either normal. So for example, this sentence here has two nouns. This one has two nouns. One which is grammatical but not meaningful or kind of meaningless. It's grammatical but doesn't mean much. 
And then we have ones that are scrambled. And we asked, we wanted to know to what extent do Braille readers keep track of the words that they've already encountered such that if they have to make a reversal, they know where to go. How to do that? How to do that? What kind of movements do they make? Do they know and zoom back as fast as possible? Or do they read backwards, looking for it? What would you do? It turns out the mean reading speeds are almost exactly the same, regardless of the sentence type. The reversal speeds, however, are quite different. The farther back you have to go, the faster you make the movements. The shorter distance you travel, the lower the velocity. There are some examples of the traces. I won't dwell on those so much. I noticed my Braille font didn't appear here. I apologize for that. But you get the same relationship again. So, repeatedly finding the same relationship between the mean speed and its intermittency looks the same, regardless of the kinds of sentences, the kinds of uh, uh, sentence structure, the task that people are prov provided with. Braille readers have the same relationship all the time. Now, it would be a fallacy for me to say I've proved anything. I have not. Because there could be that thing we refer to as the black swan, if you know what I mean. The one swan that isn't white out there. The one sentence that's going to undo my claims here. There could be. There may be. And it's up to others to look. I'm happy for that to be the case. I wish I'd found something like that, but I didn't. We've also looked at novices. I won't dwell on this because I don't have so much time left. But, but we've gone from fluent readers to novices. People who have no experience with Braille other than, oh, yes, we, yeah, I might have rubbed the, uh, the Braille in the elevator one time and said, oh, that's hard. Glad I'm not blind. But other than that, they know nothing about it. So we put them in tasks where we ask them to read along and make a judgment. Say, for example, can you tell whether in this zone here there's an odd one out? Can you tell by touch that that's the case? Well, I don't know. I don't know anything about Braille. So we don't have to know anything about Braille. You just have to know anything about dots. Is there an odd one out there? We've done this. Get them to do it at their own speed. Force them to change speeds. Use one finger, multiple fingers. The results are quite interesting, not earth shattering, not real sexy. But here is, here's the kind of thing we do. We randomly pick a sentence there and we want them to, to be able to tell, to, to discriminate, tell the difference between a sentence like this and a sentence like that with no change. Change, no change. Change, no change, change, no change. Where the difference is large, six versus one, or four versus three. Now, your intuition might be like ours. We think four versus three, that's got to be pretty hard. But if Braille can be read, surely people can detect that difference. Their finger movements, by the way, just like Braille readers, squiggly, squiggly. Oh... Uh, I won't dwell too much on this. When, the, when the, number, the difference is only one, people really struggle. That's kind of like our standard chance level. They can't do it very well. When the difference is large, they're very, very good. Almost always get it. But it doesn't matter whether they're going at a self-paced speed, twice the self-paced speed, half the self-paced speed, or the same self-paced speed time after time. Now, this for us is interesting because it demonstrates something that's long been known since cats, actually. That is, there is a constancy. Have you ever noticed? It doesn't matter how fast or slow you scan uh, sandpaper. 
it feels the same roughness. The event at the finger pad is quite different, but it feels equally rough, if it is, in fact, equally rough. For novices, Braille has the same kind of effect. You'll be not surprised, the same pattern of results. I'm starting to call this that the beads, the beads on a necklace look, because the same underlying function seems to capture all of the performance. What happens is if you tell people to speed up, they just slide everything down the string. All the beads move down. If you tell them to slow down, they move back up a bit. But they stay on that same decaying, exponential function that we saw with fluent braille readers way back when. The same is true of people who've never read. Finger difference, well, another constancy. Doing, exploring sandpaper with two fingers doesn't make a whole lot of difference relative to one. Same is true for novice braille readers. We're investigating this because we've got a problem here. We don't know where the brain is focused when you read with more than one finger. And braille readers are not real good at telling us. Here are my conclusions. Braille reading, smooth braille reading is an illusion. It's actually very complex. And the amazing thing is people can read at all, given the events at the finger pad. I admire braille readers so much. I would love to be able to contribute to increases in braille literacy. But I'm just doing my little thing here with, with braille and, and measuring their finger speeds and trying to mix up the text and the fluency of the readers and so forth. But braille readers are not like print readers. They, they perform differently, they read differently. They, the intermittency emerges for different reasons. And we're left with a whole bunch of questions. These are the questions my students and I are currently working on. They relate to experimental psychology, cognitive psychology, not pedagogy. We're starting to get into neuroscience more. But I would love it if my work helped teachers in some way. I don't know how it w might, but I would love to engage in conversation with teachers here and see if we can't think of things to do or questions to ask. And I definitely believe I would learn from you. So with that, let me stop and say thank you very much again. Thank you very much for an interesting lecture. You have time for questions. And I think this is challenges, challenge, challenging in a way because it's very technical and it's interesting. And hopefully there are some more that are into <laughs> to this <laughs> kind of, of, of science. And we have Jana Holsanova, I think. Or? Might, yeah. Hi, Jana Hosanna, is my name. I come from Lund University, Cognitive Science. It was a fascinating comparison between the behavioral patterns of print reading and braille mm. reading. Especially I was fascinated by the part of rereading and mm. I have a question concerning yes. that. Um, uh, print readers, uh, because they have this better overview, uh, can visually very quickly come back to parts of text they have read previously. And they make uh, very, very large regressions to, uh, they just jump over several lines of text to, yes. to a previous paragraph mm. or something mm. like mm. that. Mm. And it, it is a, a tricky question uh, whether there are limitations for uh, braille readers concerning how far you can come back. You mentioned some examples mm. when you had mm. one sentence, yeah. um, examples mm. where, where you could reread yeah. the words and yeah. just go quicker yeah. um, back. But mm. is there any limitation how far back you can go uh, despite that you have um, uh, no okay. view? Yeah. And is it due to motor memory or what? 
Um, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to your second question. Um, one experiment there, we got them to read to the end of the line and then they were told to go back to the first now. That's not natural, right? But we're psychologists. We do this kind of weird <laughs> stuff, right? <laughs> it's part of what we do. In natural circumstances, we observe the reversals almost always to be to the beginning of the word currently on or to the previous word, rarely to go further back than that. Okay? Now, you can easily imagine there are circumstances in which uh, you might want to reread a paragraph from the beginning. That happens in print reading. Sometimes you get tired and you lose focus and you find your eyes are just moving and you're not taking anything in and you think, oh my God, I've got to read that again. Right? Go back. I think that's technically, in an experiment, we would try to discourage that kind of lack of focus. The, re the reversals tend to be short there. They're also short with Braille readers. The problem is you can't, you can't compare the frequency in the two modes. One of them, they're very intermittent. You're either making a saccade this way or that way, right? And you can count those. They're individual, right? Um, you, can, you can count the percentage of saccades that are backward. Turns out to be about 15% typically. You can't count the number of forward movements that are, you can count the number of reversals, but they're not, they don't map onto saccades, right? So, but they tend to be short over to the beginning of the current word or word N minus one, as we say, the previous one. I would like to talk more with that about, uh, with you. Yes, Some, there one more question, yeah, please. Robert. Yes. Uh, thanks, Barry. Good, uh, good talk. And I, 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 you've probably guessed maybe what I'm going to ask you, but you know, I, I think that there may be an issue in terms of the reversals with the ecological validity of what the uh, these particular people are doing. So, in uh, your paradigm, you're having them read with a single finger, mm. always in contact with a yeah, line. So yeah. when they reverse, they have to use that single finger yeah. in yeah. contact oh. with a line. I think in uh, those of us who are uh, who are braille readers, mm. if I were to do the say the noun experiment, mm. I would use my left hand to yeah. find the first noun and then hop back over yeah. to it. So yeah. the roles of the hands and the other fingers are are something that uh, that may look very differently in natural braille reading yeah. in terms of reversals, uh, where we wouldn't necessarily uh, track backwards with a single finger to wherever it is we need to find the beginning. I would use a different hand or the other fingers to, to find Robert, those. you're quite right. You're quite right. We record from a single finger because we must. That's the nature of the technology. But we make a virtue out of this necessity. The virtue is this. When you force even fluent readers normally would use multiple fingers, two hands, to read with one finger, then you know exactly what they want to read by the location of that finger. If someone has two fingers going or four fingers going and stops and moves one back, then you can be reasonably assured that attention, where they're focusing, has gone back to f change from one finger to another. Or, or do you know, or do you know where attention is focused? Attention focus happens up here. It's invisible. You can ask people, where were you, what, which hand were you concentrating on? But asking people is not reliable for us because people's intuitions about what they're doing turn out not to be reliable. Yeah, I, That's the... Uh, I fully agree with that. But sorry, sorry. No, that's true. I, I, don't, I don't have any uh, argument with you about that. I think there was one more question over there. Is it true? Yeah? And then it's time. F yeah, okay. Uh, no, since, since you were saying that that was a limitation of the technology, I just have to ask, why are you using that technology? I've seen people film from underneath with oh, transparent yeah, well, stuff, and you seem to be able to track very well. Yes. Videotaping from underneath um, is okay, except you have to, you then have to uh, 
digitally record or record from uh, individual video frames, which is possibly in introduces measurement error artifacts, which you like to avoid. You like it to be much more digitally um, uh, an automated system. Um, there are other ways of doing it, and people in the motor control literature look at LED measurements of the fingers, and that's quite possible. Um, the, what we need to be able to do is to use refreshable braille displays with uh, measurements of multiple fingers at the same time that are not subject to measurement errors. That's what we need to do. We need to have the refreshable displays because we need to be, uh, to be able to trick people into presenting them with one word which may change between hitting this finger and this finger, for example, to see whether they detect it. This is how we would measure whether they're paying attention, which finger they're attending to, if that makes sense. So, no, I quite agree. There are more sophisticated ways to do this, and that's, what we, that's where we are headed next, I believe. Um, but there's more than one way to do it. From recording from underneath is one way, but I think a little error-prone. So, and the last question down there. Uh, my name is uh, Linda Eriksson. I'm from the National Resource Center of uh, Deafblind Issues here in Sweden. Um, I'm a Braille reader myself. And uh, I would like to know if you have done a comparison uh, between reading on paper, yeah. print braille, mm -hmm. or on a display. Because I myself can notice there's a difference in my way of reading. Ah, um, no, we haven't, we haven't done that. We focus almost always on embossed displays, not on, not on um, refreshable displays yet. Okay, I think it's time to end this session and we thank Dr. Judge very much for the interesting lecture. <laughs>